Hi, welcome. I've been streaming for a little bit and forgot to hit record. So for the YouTube channel, uh, here we go. We're, we're making a Greebly live. This is going to be the mouth plate. Okay, go. Oops. I'm sure I can download the VOD and edit that bit in later, so we'll see. Uh, it's morning. It's always morning. Um, oh, you know what I should do right now before I do this? I should draw in our glue guides. Oh, hello, Jimmy. Jimmy has come. Are you surprised that Jimmy is here? It's a Jimmy day, apparently. Remember how I said there's going to be Jimmy days and not Jimmy days? It's going to be a Jimmy day, isn't it? Maybe closing the door at some point, bud. So come and say your piece now. Okay, so we're just going to draw in our our inner lining kind of glue guide for where the fabric plate is going to sit. And these will come in handy later, just like the uh, the smalls. There we go. And so we want to put our full center line down the middle. I don't know if you can hear the kids in the daycare are out with their for their daily scream. Uh, so I'm just going to do that because we will, the actual center line is going to come in handy when we sew. Is this going to be the only, uh, be the one day build you talked about last week? Yes, indeed, Pi, this is it. Hopefully, we'll see. I'm a little, I slept weird last night, so I'm a little off today. Hopefully we can get all this done in one day, but uh, it might go into two. We'll see. We will see. That will kind of depend on how well the experiment with this uh, with this plastic goes. Cuts fairly well. That's good. It's nice and easy to get through. Let's try and get this on camera. Otherwise, there's no point in streaming. Now, it's at this stage that we could kind of make some design decisions and choices to make this particular puppet a little bit different. Should I so choose? And I do. Um, and that mostly has to do with how much of a lip uh, am I going to leave, right? So if you think about this, this mouth plate as being two pieces, um, and this is this little ridge, the line here is is where the fabric will fold over. Um, I can kind of change the profile. So if I if I take a little bit off of this end here, I'll have a little bit more of an overbite. Uh, and I think I like that. So I am just going to eyeball trim a little bit off the bottom here. So we've got more of a, a rounded shape on the bottom and the fleece is flexible enough that it will kind of accommodate for that even if we're even if we don't alter the pattern for that so just to give it a little bit of a different shape not much you don't need much and it's better to do a little bit at first and then kind of trim away in little bits rather than do a big chunk all at once and realize you've gone too far. And there we go. Now, of course, the flaw in all this is I've put on all these marks and this stuff has to be sanded. Uh, so I'm going to be sanding off the marks I made, although I probably won't be sanding off them all so I can I can recreate them. And that's OK. But now I'm just going to cut. Separate the two. There we go. And I am going to, when we all mark, I'll mark now. I'll mark on this side. Top. And bottom. 
Uh, so the sanding comes next because, like I said, this stuff has a kind of a coating on it that will uh, not take glue very well. So we need to prep that. I'm gonna find some sandpaper. Hello, Jimmy. Yes. If you uh, if you follow my uh, Facebook or Twitter, I um, posted a video up there from like an hour or two ago. Jimmy, not letting me do the mic check. It was in my lap and it wasn't getting out. I tell ya. The, the the curse of being lovable. So I'm just sanding this down to give it a bit of a rough, rough texture that the glue can grab onto. I'm also trying not to sand off my <laughs> marker. Should have sanded it first. Monday, what do you expect? That's all right, this will be fine. I think. He's a little more chill. It's got a slight Tron quality to it. I want him in the game until he dies playing. Acknowledge. So that's just taking a bit of the, taking some of the gloss off. No drop frames, that's what I like to see. Yeah, so the, it looks like I got the technical issues ironed out. Um, the playback and the VOD looked fantastic. No drop frames at all, so I think we're good from a technical standpoint. And now, the most important drop tool of all, the Swiffer. We need to Swift. There you go, your work surface is Swift. Swiffed. And I'm just going to take the file, and uh, just like we did with the small other place, I'm going to file down these edges because uh, particularly in this case, there is no foam, so the fabric, the fabric itself actually gets pulled across this edge. So you really want this edge nice and smooth. So I'm probably going to be on a camera here a little bit. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> but this is very important. Get the edges filed down and smooth. See, this is this is all I'm doing. I'm just going along the edges with a an emery board and filing them down. So this, this edge here is nice and smooth. Um, I'm just doing it over garbage can so I don't have to have that much to Swiffer. Give you a Swiffer a break. My concern with using these cutting boards is there is, I mean, they're considerably thinner than the plastic I usually use. So I'm, I wonder how much structure I'm going to lose in the house. Sorry, I'm really, the camera is going nuts, isn't it? Um, yeah, we'll see. This is an experiment. If it doesn't go well, then we'll, this is going to be a two day build instead of a one day build. But like I said before, the point of these streams is I'm just doing what I would be doing during the day anyway. So this is what I was going to do today.
This may be a long stream. If the momentum is good, if this works out, I am going to try and push and do it all in one day. So uh, it may be going long. I actually planned for this. I made a stew yesterday and just put it in the fridge. So dinner tonight would be nice and quick. And uh, so I don't have to like, you know, log off and go make dinner because it's already made. Part of being a responsible adult is planning for things like that. Yes, he cooks as well. <laughs> it's all part of the same process. You can use the creative part of your brain in many ways. It's got to nurture it. video gaming music. It's uh, called Looking Glass by Zircon. That first pretzel actually, um, you connect it to your Twitch account, and it was like announcing in chat every new song instead of having the little pop-up thing. And I didn't like that because chat was just going to be full of bot spam from the music service and I didn't want that. So we turned it off. So if there is any song that you'd like to know what it is, ask me and I'll tell you. <laughs> Okay, I think that's pretty good. It's at least as good as it's going to get. The problem is, of course, with something like this, um, because this, this material is so thin, there comes a point past which you can't really file anymore. Like, it's, it's not going to get smoother because it's that thin, so. And I think we hit that point. All right, that's not bad. That's okay. It's the one part of a regular Greebly that makes me nervous because like I said, the, the, the fabric is always, when you turn it, the fabric pushes and rubs against this edge. So I don't want it to damage the fabric in any way. That seems okay. So now what? Um, I guess we can put the grips on here now. So I'm going to do the grips the same way I did the small. They're just going to be a, a simple band across each jaw. Uh, let me see if I can... Yeah, that should be enough. Do I keep a pen? No, let's get a pen. So just like with the smalls, I'm going to kind of go, all right, well, probably about halfway. Um, this is the bottom. This is the top. Hello, Jimmy. I can hear you. Yes. Good. Excellent. I'm glad you're filling us in on these important issues. Where did he go? There he is. You stay out of that. That's not a litter box. Don't go in there. <laughs> Interestingly enough, one of the things I have made mouth plates out of... Where is he going with this? Uh go to the dollar store and um, and you can get cat litter trays. Brand new, totally clean, never been used. They're just formed plastic, but they tend to be a bit cheaper than uh, the storage bins. So that's not a bad source of plastic either. But because of that, I would have like stacks of 
clean litter trays <laughs> under my, my work surface here. Thankfully, our cats are very good about using the facilities in the appropriate way. So there's never been a problem, but I don't want that to ever be a problem. So, um, And just like last time, I'm going to mark two dots for where we're going to drill some holes. These, I'll bet you I could just punch holes because they're so thin. I don't know if I really need to put these on the drill press. Hmm. Let's see. Again, this is all a big experiment. Could go horribly wrong at any time. But uh, this is a leather punch. And as you may guess, it's used to punch holes in leather. But let's just see what we can do. How is that? Not great. I think I may have to get the drill press out. Uh, you can buy plastic that isn't made into anything already. As a matter of fact, I have some right here. Uh, you absolutely can buy this big old sheets of plastic. It actually tends to be a bit more expensive. Um, which is odd, I know, but that's just the way it is. Uh, it's the kind of thing that, um, if you were going to put it into a vacuum form machine, you can buy thermoplastic in big sheets like that. Oops, good junk. Um, but uh, like I said, it just it just tends to be cheaper <laughs> if you to like buy something that's already made, which you know I know doesn't make any sense, but. You can get about that much plastic at a dollar store for like eight bucks. And I think that sheet was like 16 bucks or so. So it's like, you know, it's economics. Okay, well, this is, this will make a hole. It just takes a bit of work. Does he get the drill press out or doesn't? I guess for the sake of education, Let's get the drill press out and just see how this stuff drills, because I don't know. This may, like, melt or shatter or something, so... It'll be fun for the stream to see something melting or shattering. Forgive my back to the camera. Uh, drill press. Yeah, I get the drill press. That means I have to stand up. Oh boy. How did we do this last time? We went to the wide camera, didn't we? Hello, wide camera. I turned off the autofocus on the wide camera. I noticed it was doing really weird things. Um, we don't want really weird things. We only want some a bit weird, not totally weird. Eye protection, of course, safety first. And I'm going to start this on the slowest speed. And we'll just see what happens. Okay, that did okay. A little bit of flash, but expect that. That did okay. It did about as well as the other stuff, so. Gotta clean it up a bit, but that's alright. 
Yes, Pi, this is different music from last week. So I don't know if you, I guess you weren't here when I was talking about, when I put the archives up on the YouTube channel, um, the YouTube uh, did a copyright violation. <laughs> so that music is fine for Twitch, but it's not licensed for YouTube. Uh, it wasn't a DCMA complaint, so it wasn't like a legally actionable thing. It was just, hey, you can't monetize this video. Um, I don't really care because I don't monetize the videos anyway, so... But I don't want to use any music that isn't licensed for the platforms that I'm putting it on. So this is a new music service called Pretzel Rocks, or new, new, new to me at least. Um, that is apparently licensed for both Twitch and YouTube. So I'm not sure I'm crazy about it. Uh, the music is a bit... It's not quite as chill. The beats, the beats aren't as chill, and this is the chill station, so... I don't know. We'll see. It'll do for now. And it's cleaning off the little flash bits that... the drill press left. I mean, the thing is, this is these are the holes for the stitching, so it's just got to allow a needle to pass through it, so they don't have to be big or anything. No, it's irritating me. You don't like it? This stuff is fine. There's there's some that were earlier that did for vaguely industrial. That uh, yeah, I mean that's fine for some things, but not great puppet building music. Let me see. Well, there is. Hang on. This is this is the chill station. There's another station that's called ambient. Maybe we'll try that one. Ambient. There we go. This I am assuming this is going to be mostly just sort of noise in the background and no actual like beats per se. So we'll see. I'm I'm with you though. I'm with you. I I wasn't crazy about that music. If I could, it would be nothing but Jelly Roll Morton. But uh, that would also probably be fine in terms of copyright. It is hundred years old at this point. Um, okay, that looks pretty good. So now uh, we've got to cut our straps to size. And just like the smalls, the point is that you just want to be a little bit loose on these. <sighs> yeah, two jazz fans together, exactly. And here's the, the uh, King Oliver set. So these are just going to be a little bit raised off of the surface. Um, they are elastic, so they'll stretch, and this is just to allow somebody's finger to pass through, so. Boy, this sure is ambient. It's so ambient it barely exists. for that one. And this is for the top. There we go. So, now I gotta close the door. So we're about to bust out the barge. I also got to put the fan on to vent those noxious fumes. Excuse me for a moment. And let me get over. Oh, I got all this stuff in the way. Is this blowing in or out? Out. Good. <laughs> That's what I want. 
I don't know if the, if the wide angle can pick it up. No, not really. There's a, see this gray hose here? This is, this is the power cable that leads up to the fan. Uh, so now we're gluing, gluing with the barge, the scary, scary barge. The applicator. And we've got our magic hair dryer ready to go. So this is where we find out if this plastic is going to take glue. <laughs> this is this is kind of crucial to the rest of the project. So let's uh, experiment. Probably going to have to our magic hair dryer. This, yep. Magic, but it's real. Okay, so just like with the small, I'm painting a little bit of glue around the ends where the holes are. And around the ends of the strap where they will be glued over the holes. And also going down the edge, well, camera and I, going across the edge as well to help the fabric not to fray when this glue sets. Just like we did with the smalls. There's that. And I'll do this one. And as always, don't need a lot of glue. Very thin coat. That's all you need. And we'll just go that way. This way, this way. Boy, this is extremely atmospheric. There's nothing but air. <gasps> oh no! We got it hurt us. We got chill beats. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah? How? You gonna insult us? Fine, we'll give you chill beats. Oops. little bit of glue on the work surface there that's a very bad thing you always want to clean that up immediately because soon we're going to be laying fleece on here and you don't want glue on your fleece where you don't want glue on your fleece it's a life lesson okay so we've got our glue on our bits now we're gonna dry them just like before the cord for the hair dryer is clicking the mouse. I hope I don't click anything by accident that I shouldn't. <laughs> the moment of truth. So we're going to press straps down onto the glue. It will sit in place. 
And... Hmm. Lifting off a little bit. More than I would like, but I think it'll be okay. Again, these, this glue is just for insurance. We are going to stitch this. That's what the holes are for. So, it's not super great. Um, it's definitely not, doesn't hold strongly as it does with that ABS plastic, but we'll, we'll see. I think it'll be okay. Yeah, it's all right. Okay. Uh, stitching. Now we stitch. Again, color doesn't matter because this is internal. I just happen to have some green thread here, so that's what I'm using. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I'm already... I've already got a bit on the needle there, so let's use that. Why not? Gonna have to re-thread at some point soon, but that's okay. And since I'm sewing, why don't we switch back to this cam? For a moment, at least. That stream quality looks okay. Huh? Seems all right to me. So I'm just stitching this through the holes that we made. Just like we did with the small. And this will hold it super strong. You would have to put in a great deal of effort to uh, to bust these. I would advise not doing that. I haven't even decided what color. <laughs> I'm gonna do this creepily. See what I have? I have lots of blue fur. I actually have several shades of blue fur, including a very nice kind of peacock blue that I think I'm leaning towards. And I have a ginormous amount of green fleece, so maybe I'll do green fleece in blue fur. Sounds nice. We'll have a look at what they look like together and and decide then. Played a lot of video games on the weekend. Got about halfway through Miles Morales. I like that game a whole lot. Put on the Into the Spider-Verse soundtrack. Uh, his hair is a different color to his body. Is it always uh, so unagreeably? So on the regular greeblies on these basic ones i do like to sort of mix up the color combinations because it just give, it gives me as a builder more options uh because i do try and make them all a bit different obviously some color combinations are just ugly and i won't do them but uh if i can you know if i can make a greeblie that hasn't had this particular combination of colors before i'll try and do that uh, on the on the deluxe greeblies, I generally try and do them a kind of uniform color. Like if I have you know blue fur, I'll try and do blue fleece as well. Maybe maybe different shades. But there's something about the kind of unicolor. Um, funnily enough, this this one here is uh, purple on purple. 
<laughs> and that's a regular, that isn't a deluxe Gravely, so... So it's not always the case, it's really just what I have in stock. And I have a lot of blue... And a lot of blood, a lot of blue fur, and a lot of green fleece. So that's probably what <laughs> I'll end up going with. Um, and then, of course, so there's two types of hair, right? There's the fur, and then there's the ostrich fringe on the top. And it will also depend on what colors of ostrich fringe I have in stock. I have a fair amount right now, but we'll see. I just kind of feel it <laughs> in the moment. See what I've got. See what feels right. I will kind of plan ahead for a deluxe Greebly and go, you know, I want this specific color of fur and fleece. But for regular Greeblies, I just kind of wing it. Also with deluxe Greeblies, since they have the eyelids, there's also another color there. I, I like to do a contrasting color in the eyelids. So there's three <laughs> color options. And like I said, it usually just depends on what I've got hanging around. I've been thinking more about that uh, same ingredients last week. Maybe, maybe I have a ton. Oh, so the green that we used for the small last week, which camera, this camera, um, the green that we used for the small was the frog color from Puppet Pelts. I haven't got as much of that as I do of the, the lizard, which is a slightly more subtle green. And I think the lizard might go better with the peacock blue fur. Um, it's a little more, it's not quite as, as intense and bright. It's a little more subtle. So I think that's probably what we'll go with. But we'll see. After I'm done this, uh, I think we'll start cutting the fleece and the fur, and so we have to decide what colors they're going to be. So let's just get this done, and we'll move on. I have... I generally try and keep blue fur in stock in general because, like, of course, because of the Muppets and Sesame Street, there, there's kind of a trope with like the furry blue monster, you know, like Cookie Monster and Grover and Harry Monster. There's like blue monster, blue furry monster seem to be like a thing. And uh, whenever I make a furry blue monster, they sell really quickly. <laughs> so I try and have at least one furry blue monster in, in, the, in the works at any one time. I don't right now. I probably should. I was actually planning on the next big furry monster I do being green. I have a bunch of lovely olive green fur uh, that uh, I've been itching to use, and I think that's what it's going to be. If I build that in stream or not is a bit of a question, because as I said before, the big furry monsters are like 90% hand sewing. And that's just dull. <laughs> There's nothing much to watch on stream for that, so... It's like this the whole time. But we'll see. I also think it will be fun to watch a big furry monster being built from, from nothing, so... We will see. I think this music station is a bit better. How do you feel on Pi? It seems to be a little bit less intrusive. You've got the tinkly Mr. Rogers music here right now. Here we go. 
Yes, less repetitive. True. Ambient it is, for the time being at least. Somebody has to speak to Pretzel Rocks about their algorithm for chill, because what it what it was was not chill. Not got a little bit messy, but that's all right. Everything's fine. Trim off this excess. So there we go. We got the straps on the top and the bottom. Oh, on camera. Boom. Straps on the top and the bottom. Uh, and so this will go something like something like this inside. So you can see. So now that we've got that, close the glue up. Uh, I guess we'll go with fur and fleece, the siding colors. Pardon me for being out of frame again. It's gonna happen. So let me get the fur first and put these aside. And here is a lovely peacock blue. It's almost purpley on camera. It's not quite as purpley as that um, in real life, but it's uh, it's got a lovely sheen to it. It's really it's really quite pretty. So that's the blue I'm thinking of using for the fur. And here is the lizard green fleece I'm thinking of using. It's a, it's not quite as bright as uh, as this camera. Let me see if I can. What camera has the best color reproduction? Probably this one. Let's see. Yeah, that's pretty close to what it's like IRL. So here's here's what I'm thinking. I think that's pretty nice. Uh, and it's my workshop, so this, that's what we're doing. So I guess we'll cut the body first. So here we go. We've got our fur laid out. Um, also paying very close attention because all the fur has a nap, right? So it has a direction that it's going. In this case, the fur is going this way down. That GoPro has got really weird color reproduction today. It's very yellow. It shouldn't be like that. I gotta all fix that. Not right now. Um, so making sure that we're aware what color, what direction the nap of the fur is going. And in fact, I usually will draw an arrow that just sort of indicates we know the fur is going in that direction. Keep this out. We'll need that. Um, so patterns for the body. Open the big pattern book. And here is the back of the body and the front. Oh, that is very yellow. I'm sorry. That's bugging the heck out of me. Let me see if I can do something about that right now. Wow, that's awful. GoPro, what are you doing? Hopefully. Hopefully with the door closed, the Wi-Fi will connect. Yes, that's a thing that happens in my apartment. We have a very, a very long, narrow apartment. Um, and it's kind of built like a Faraday cage. There's like there's steel uh, girders and stuff. So getting Wi-Fi from one end of the apartment to the other is a bit of a challenge sometimes. And I'm going to need Wi-Fi to connect to the GoPro. We'll just see if we can 
you can get that because I can these these cars. This is white, believe it or not. You can see actually on the uh, on the picture in picture. This is a case where the picture in picture version is much more accurate. Here we go. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay, here we go. I'm in the GoPro. Uh, this is great. Live technical adjustments. Everybody loves those. White balance auto. Um, no GoPro. Let's see. Check out that. Wow, oversaturated. That's better. That's pretty. Nah, it's still getting a little yellow again then. Wait a minute, what's native? That's native? Let's have a word with our friends in GoPro, shall we? Okay, we're gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. That's probably the best we're gonna get for now. Um, I gotta, I gotta play with the settings on the GoPro here. That ain't, that still ain't great. That's really quite washed out, isn't it? Hmm. Sorry, I'm sorry. But hey, we're learning together. I guess that's it. I can probably color correct this in the video switcher, but that's going to require a little bit more work than I'm I'm going to do. I got, I'll have to do that off stream, but I'll work on that between streams. Not great, but that's not bad. That at least looks more like white. Uh, okay, we're tracing out our body patterns. What I like to do, since we've already got a cut edge here and, and the fur is off of it quite nicely, um, I just like to use that as one of my lines. So when I'm laying these out, it's a couple of things to know about cutting fur. Um, the very first thing is, yeah, good improvement. Yeah, it's it's better. This isn't perfect, but it's better. Uh, the, the color reproduction in the picture in picture in this shot is a bit more true than the GoPro. Um, so when you're cutting fur, what you don't want to do, you don't ever want to take a pair of scissors and then just kind of go in like this. Because what you're going to do is you're going to cut the fur as well as the netting. And that's going to change the length of the fur. And you don't want that. You want the fur to be at the maximum length it can be. Um, and you just want to cut the netting. So although you can cut fur with scissors, what you have to do is you kind of have to angle it and get it in underneath the fur and then just do little snips along the netting. Um, that's tricky and slow. So the best way, here we go, is remember our old friend, the big scary razor blade? That is the best way to cut fur. Um, oh, we haven't traced out the lines yet, so we're not gonna get that out yet. Um, the other thing is, I, I am going to be doing most of this on a machine, so uh, we want to leave seam allowances on, on both sides here. Um, there's going to be two bits of hand sewing in the regular Greebly. It's going to be the uh, the mouth plate and joining the head to the body are both bits of hand sewing. So that's where this whole process is going to get bogged down. However, we're not there yet. So what I'm going to do is just going to trace out our pattern. Making sure to mark the center line that's there, because that's going to be important when we go to attach the head. Also mark the center line on the bottom just for the sake of argument. Okay, and before I trace the other one, I'm going to take my gauge, wherever it's got to. Good heavens. You'd think I'd be prepared. Here we go. Take our seam gauge and I'm gonna put about three quarter. But well, I mean less than half an inch. You don't need much seam allowance, but you need some. It really all depends on how confident you are on the machine. I'm not, I mean, you see me work the machine. It's a bit of a 
trial of wills. So I like to give myself a good healthy seam allowance just to make sure that nothing gets weird. Because particularly fur will, will, will shift and move. And so you'll never get it quite perfect. But what is perfect after all? So there we go. There's our seam allowance on the back, and now we gotta do the front. So just remembering that we are gonna add that much seam allowance on this side, we want to place it far enough away that we can do that. There we go. So you'll see the Greebly body is really, really simple. It's really just a tube that's been tapered and then had the scoops for the, um, the circular neck kind of built into it. We will be doing more uh, sort of contoured rounded bodies in other puppets later on. You got a taste of that already in the uh, in the small as a as a nice round, plump little pear shaped body. But these work well for the Greeblies. This is it's quite nice, and it feels good when you use them as well. There we go. There are our patterns drawn out with our seam allowances. And again, you see, like these aren't like mathematically perfect or anything. This is, you know, as close as I can get reasonably, but you don't have to worry about being crazy precise. So, Again, being very aware, this is an extremely sharp and dangerous piece of equipment. And you cut just the netting. And it's much easier to cut just the netting when you're using a razor blade or an X-Acto knife. I've done this with X-Acto knives too. And that works just fine. This blade is pretty dull. I think we may have to splurge and open a new one on this side's pretty good. There we go. Here we go. There's that. I do have to really focus, so I will be being a bit quiet while I'm doing this. Better than cutting your finger off. There we go. So now 
putting the blade back into the safety case. And there is the front and back of our Gravely body. Not bad. So I guess I'll pin these now. What the plan is, is I'm going to like cut out and pin all of the bits and then get the machine out and sew everything all at once. Uh, and then uh, kind of assemble them at the end. I have found that that's the way it goes most efficiently. Rather than like taking this, pinning it, then getting the machine out, sewing it, then cutting the fleece out, sewing that. I like to sort of get all the bits cut out first and then, then attach them all together. So I'm going to pin these. Pinning fur is not fun. Um, because it's fur. And this result is very thick. And you can see here, um, what you want to do when you pin, A, you want to use a lot of pins, and B, you want to kind of run your finger down the seam and kind of poke, comb the fur inside that seam so there's none sort of sticking out. So... There's one pin. I'm going to go down a couple inches. Make sure all that fur is brushed in. There's nothing quick about puppet baking. It is not for the impatient. So you see it just going down a couple of inches, putting another pin in. most important thing here is to make sure that all that fur is tucked into the seam so it's not poking out. And at the end, you'll see that the, I don't know if the camera can pick this up, it's a little bit uneven here. This, this bit's a bit longer than that bit. That's okay. You will not see that at the bottom. It's because there's all this fur hanging over it. So. That's all right. It's more important to be precise at the top here, because this is where the neck joins onto. Um, the bottom, like I say, when you turn this inside out, it's just a bunch of fur. So, fur is nice in that it does that. You can hide <laughs> the slight imperfections because it's big and furry, and who sees? You know, all you see is the fur. Um, one nice thing about fur, particularly in this case, is you can do this. I'm going to sew this on the machine which normally when you sew on a machine with fleece, you just, you will never hide that seam. Um, you will not see the seam on fur. It's, uh, it has one advantage and that's the advantage. So let me just turn this around so I can see it. There's another bent pin I should get rid of. He says, and then does absolutely nothing about it. That's how the pins get bent, by the way. What I'm just doing here, this is, <laughs> this is how it happens. Because it's, you know, it's big, thick stuff. So you put the pin in, I'll show you in a sec here, so I get this fur brush down. Put the pin in, then you have to twist it, poke it out again. Uh, and that's a fair amount of pressure <laughs> on that pin. Uh, so that's how the pins get bent. 
police has never done that to a pin, only fur. Do puppets tend to attract static? Good question. I haven't noticed any yet. Um, and we have carpet everywhere in our apartment, including this room. So uh, I would probably notice that. But no, I haven't noticed. I haven't noticed a lot of static buildup. I'm not getting shocks constantly <laughs> as I'm building puppets. Um, sometimes when, when you brush, like sometimes when you've got a big furry animal and you're, you're brushing it out, you will, the fur will, will kind of get that static charge and kind of be floaty and then stick to stuff. So it, it can do that when you're brushing it out, but uh, not, not in this kind of thing, not uh, normally. Like I said, I live in the Faraday cage, so, you know, po I'm possibly right now charging somebody's iPhone downstairs. <laughs> That one lined up pretty good. That that cut went to quite well. All right, so there's our body all pinned. So we will put that aside and start dealing with the fleece. I'm putting a lot of things aside today. I'm running out of side. So, um, for the fleece, what we got next is, there we go, there's a greebly head. <laughs> I know it doesn't look like much, but it is. And somewhere in here, greebly arms. I was wondering where the hair standing on end. Yeah, like I said, when you when you brush it out, that can happen. But I've never noticed it to any like serious degree. Um, so these are what we're doing next, and I guess got to decide. So we do the arms the same way that we did this, the small arms. We just, like, trace them out and then run the machine through on them. Um, I guess I could probably say a word about the fingers. Um, you'll, you'll notice that Greeblies have an unusual number of fingers. Uh, and this is also true of the small, and this is true of most of my original characters. Um, I'm not sure why I do them like this. I, ever since I was a little kid, every monster I've designed has always had this kind of three-fingered hand. And I just like it. I don't, I, you know, I don't know, really, there isn't really an intellectual reason why. It's just aesthetic. I just like how it looks. It looks a bit alien. Um, and yet it's still functional, like it still could clearly be a hand that could, you know, use tools and stuff. So um, there's just something a little bit alien about it that I like a lot. And also it's the Spock thing, you know, the blonde and prosper. Um, so that's it. It's just kind of a signature thing that I do. Uh, so that's, that's the reason for the three fingers. Uh, are puppets ever made with their mouths closed at rest? Well, um, you can make puppets with their mouths at sort of different angles. So like, you know, maybe a little bit more closed than this, or but never, never totally closed because then when they open, you can't really, you don't, there isn't enough fabric allowance in there to let it do that. So it will fold and buckle kind of weird. So you always want to make your patterns at, at kind of mostly open, but not open all the way, um, just to allow the fabric that much space to kind of move and fold. Um, that's one of the neat things about the Gravely design and also about Kermit. This is a very similar pattern to Kermit. It's not exactly a Kermit, but um, Kermit actually doesn't have this curve here. Uh, and the profile of the chin is a little bit different on Kermit, but it's similar. And one of the neat things that it does, I can show you on... Everybody comments on this and yet the big secret is there's nothing to it there's this takes no effort at all um you see when you close the mouth you get this nice dimple here that is just what happens when the fabric folds that's just a result of so this this head pattern right here is exactly the same pattern that we're using right now 
Um, this is what it looks like when you, when you build it. And so you see when you build it, the mouth is kind of like that. And then when you close it, you get this nice fold that creates that dimple. And everybody loves that dimple. And that dimple just happens naturally. You don't have to do anything <laughs> to accomplish that. So um, that's real nice. We like that a lot. So you take advantage of that and you, you build your design around that. But that's the reason why you generally build your puppets with, with their mouths open. And it can be open different degrees. It depends on, uh, yeah, just like a smile, exactly. It depends on how much of that dimple you want. If you want less dimple, you build your you build your mouth more closed. The more open you get it, the bigger the dimple will be when you close. So that's why we do it like that. Secrets of puppet building right here. I'm gonna do Henson Workshop's gonna come after me. I'm kidding, they won't. And if they do, I'm available, folks. You want to open a Canadian branch of the Henson Workshop, I'm here for that. So we've got our fleece here. And we'll do the head first. See, this is kind of folded, but it'll be okay. So we've got it doubled up, just like before. Fold it inside out. And we're going to trace our head and pin it. Um, now, this is an interesting point about, you know, we're talking about the stretch of fleece and fleece just stretches one way more than the other. In this case, it stretches this way more than this way. And that's the way we want it. You always want the stretch going horizontal. The problem with this head pattern, of course, since the mouth is open, as we've established, if, so the neck is going to sit kind of like this, right? Straight up and down. And so we want the stretch going like that. However, when the, when the head is actually, because this bends, so when the head is, is being held in position where the eyes go up here and the eyes looking forward, we actually want the stretch to be like that. And as you can see, those are kind of opposite <laughs> to each other. So what I have found is that the only thing you can really do is kind of compromise and go about halfway it's more important for the stretch to to be on the neck uh than on the top of the head because the neck is like you want this a bit flexible so people can get their arm through um so i just kind of go you know kind of about halfway we compromise uh and that's that Oh, you'll also notice I did use um, a regular old Sharpie on the fur. I'm not going to do that on the fleece because as we talked about before, um, fleece, the marker will show through. And you don't want that on fur, it's not going to show through. So a fur, you can use a regular old marker. But on fleece, I'm going to use the disappearing, the vanishing ink. So we're just going to get this in place. And this, since we are going to sew this on the machine, we also want to add a seam allowance on the top and on the bottom, we don't add a seam allowance on the neck or the mouth. The neck and the mouth are going to get hand sewn. Four reasons. Go into those reasons when we get there. I also have a little center line here on the mouth, you'll see, marked out. And that's to help align the fabric mouth plate. And when I say help, I mean help. It is not a, uh, an absolute guide because, as I said before, when you sew these things together, they shift around a little bit. You'll get a couple of millimeters out, so your center is no longer center, and you just use that as a guide and kind of eyeball it from there. How are we doing? That looks pretty good. Okay, so now we have to add our seam allowance. And the seam allowance doesn't have to be super precise or anything. This is 
the seam allowance is the line we cut and the pattern line is the line that we sew. This is just to, to give some room on the machine so we can get it on there and, and have enough uh, that the machine can cope with it. So it, it doesn't have to be crazy precise, which is good because they can be tricky to cut out. Where you do have to be careful cutting out in this case, at least for this pattern. So yeah, with the seam allowance, you just kind of play connect the dots. You just kind of go in intervals and then join them all up. Um, what what you where I do have to be careful cutting is along the mouth line because that is this is the this still gets sewn, but this is going to be hand sewn. And you want to be a little bit more precise here. You don't want a lot of jagged edges or, or anything like that. The neck is, you don't have to be crazy precise because that gets sewn to fur. But nevertheless, so now that we got this, I'm going to pin it just like we did with the smalls. Oh, we can get another box of pins out. We've got the hands to do it yet. And before we actually get to the sewing part, I'm going to get some more plastic. I'm going to finish building all the plastic parts that go in it because there's a few more. There's a there's hand plates and a back plate for the eyes as well. And I'm going to get those cut out and sanded and ready to go. So that's that's the modus operandi. We're just going to get all the bits ready to be assembled and then assemble them. Avengers Assemble. And you'll notice I'm pinning inside the uh, sew line. Oh, oh, a new follower, 999 Pickles Plus. Hello, welcome. How are you this fine Monday? It's a fine Monday. That can't happen. That's a contradiction in terms. And like before, you want to use a fair number of pins. The more pins you use, the less sliding around it will do on the machine. For a deluxe Greebly, I saw the word puppet. I could not uh, watch. I love puppets so much that I ignored my hate of follower only. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. This is a uh, this is a chill stream where we just hang out and make puppets. It's funny, you know. There's a lot. There's there's a quite a, a community um, of puppet people, and they all have similar stories. Where it's like, yeah, I loved it as a, when I was a kid, but then I kind of forgot about it, and then I found it again. Uh, what are you making? Can you do the voices for puppets? Oh, yes. Um, so I guess you're new. Um, uh, for a while, I was doing an always on channel on Twitch that showed uh, my puppet show, which is called The Oracle. Uh, if you check out the social links, you'll see a link to your YouTube channel. Um, and that's got the show that is called The Oracle. And I do all of the puppeteering, all the voices on that. Um, what I am making is that thing right there. That's called a Greebly. I have a, a small Etsy shop that I sell professional puppets in, and I have several kind of base models. And this is one of the basic models of puppet that I sell, and that's what we're making. We're going to try and make a whole puppet in, in one sitting, so that's going to be a challenge. <laughs> yes, please do. Like I said, all those all those social links should be on the Twitch channel. So follow me in all the different places. And uh, there's a whole world of puppetry stuff out there. Uh, excuse me, I do have to stand up for this bit, but I'm going to cut out this head real rough at first. Here we go. Does my glasses fall off? You know, uh, 
then it's, this is a good thing that you found this channel. <laughs> if you're seriously obsessed with puppets, because this will lead you to a whole puppet community. Go on Facebook, go on Twitter, go on YouTube. There's tons of puppetry stuff out there. Just because the Muppets are um, not quite as popular as they used to be, doesn't mean there's nothing out there. There's plenty out there. So here we go. Very carefully. Cutting out our greebly head. <laughs> Scumboy. Thank you, Scumboy. I probably shouldn't use your real name since you're... Oh, we're using made-up names. Right. Yes, uh, Scumboy and I are, are friends, IRL. So, welcome! And... Cutting, cutting, cutting. It's a weird day. I slept really weird. I'm feeling odd. I don't know why. Too much time playing them video games on the weekend. I'm not quite on my A game today, so this could go bad. Yeah, it's definitely, it is extremely Monday. How does the new mic sound? Does it sound better, I hope? I think it's less plosion-y. Uh, even the days are meaningless now. Yeah, they sure are. All right, this is the crucial bit, so I gotta be... I gotta be focused to do this. Cutting around the mouth. All right, boom. Starting to come together. So now we've got a greebly body and a greebly head. There we go. Done. It's a puppet. Uh, Mike, your question. Which lav mic could you switch to? So they, I was going to get the, um, the Rode Wireless Go, which are very well reviewed. But then there's this is a, comp, a competitor of theirs. This is the Kamika Boom XD. Here we go, Jamie. There you go. This is the Kamika Boom XD. Uh, and the nice thing about these ones are um, you get two mics and a, and a transmitter. Um, plus the plus the lav mic, so. And they're about the same price as the Rode Wireless Go, so. Um, yeah, they're teeny tiny. This is the mic. <laughs> this is it. Uh, so it's much more comfortable to wear than the, remember the, the wireless mics that we used in the live stream before? Um, those were annoying and big and sounded bad. So I spent a couple of bucks. But so far they're pretty good. They've got about a four hour battery per. Um, the downside of them, FYI, I found this out testing them on the weekend. The downside of these mics is at the transmitter level there is like a 20 millisecond delay. You probably don't notice it on the stream, but like if you were to record uh, like on camera with this, you would you would it would be out of sync, and there's no way to fix that. You have to like adjust it in post, and so it's not great for like a recorded production. You'd probably want to go with the road. Uh, yeah, you'd have to resync in post. It's really annoying. It's fine for the live stream, so so that's fine. I was I was almost tempted to return them and just get a road wireless go, but um, that's good enough good enough for now. I don't want to, I don't want to expense too much till I can sell more puppets. Speaking of selling more puppets, I'm going to do the arms now. And let's see which way is our stretch. Our stretch is this way. Okay. So, Just like before. Wow, I'm actually getting to the end of this green. This, look at how much of it there is. I've got another bag full of this stuff. This was when I was actively making Kermit. <laughs> I 
Don't worry, lots of puppets. We'll have lots of puppets. There's lots of puppets in this room. There's so many puppets in this room that some of them are shoved in the closet. So just like with the smalls, these arms just get traced on a big sheet, the folded fleece. Oh yeah, no, Kermit is, Kermit will happen one day. Um, what, what ended up happening is uh, the store took off <laughs> and suddenly people were paying me to make puppets. And in this economy, this is currently my only source of income. Uh, so I kind of went, you know what? I should probably focus on that. So that's what happened to Kermit. Now I am going to take some time. Yeah, it is a good problem to have, no question. I'm gonna take some time over the holidays. Uh, one of the things I wanna do is start building and uh, are designing and building the new Frankie and the Oracle, which I am going to build on stream, but somewhere in there I may have more Kermiting time. Because um, I would like to build a Kermit. Who doesn't want a Kermit? You can't have one, because I, I can't sell them, but I can build one for me. And I can show you how to build one for you. Does that make you happy, Mr. Disney Lawyer? So just like the hands for the small, I gotta make sure that these aren't too close together. Yes, personal use Kermit only. <laughs> I swear this is not a Kermit for commercial sale. This is a Kermit for personal use. Uh, so you'll notice I've marked these little marks here. This is where we're not gonna sew. These are gonna be the holes that we open so we can um, turn the hands and then this is where we're gonna stuff the inserts and we'll make the foam and wire armature inserts soon. Yeah, I mean, you know, we can get into the whole I permitted arses. <laughs> yeah, I think arses is fine. It is a family friendly channel, but I mean, come on, you're supposed to be thir at least 13 before you're allowed to even use Twitch. So I think we're okay. Um, you know, I, I absolutely understand the need for uh, like intellectual property protection. I mean, it is important that creators get to keep control of the things that they create. Um, but there's also fair use, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a trade-off. How long have you been making puppets? What made you start? Well, good question. In terms of serious building professional puppets like what I am doing right now, um, just over a year, actually. It hasn't been that long. I did design and build puppets when I was a kid. And by kid, I mean like between the ages of 12 and 14 or so. Um, didn't know what I was doing. And this was in the dark ages before the internet. Can you even conceive of such a thing? Um, and so I had no idea what I was doing. And I kind of uh, just kind of forgot about it for a while. And then a couple of years ago, I'm going to tell this story often on the stream. <laughs> Did I say bums? Yeah, it's all right. Don't worry. Um, a couple of years ago, in October of 2018, uh, myself and Scumboy and our partners were on a weekend trip to New York City. And in New York City, there is a wonderful museum called the Museum of the Moving Image. And in the Museum of the Moving Image, they have a permanent Jim Henson exhibit. And it was at that exhibit <laughs> that... Uh, that it sparked the neurons, the puppet, the puppet brain cells came alive again. And since then I started 
my YouTube channel with the Oracle, and then from there started building again. And so between ages 14 and 50, there were no puppets, and then suddenly there were puppets. And so now I have my own little Etsy store. I've taken some courses in puppet building, and uh, and now we're here building puppets live on the internet. <laughs> I lipstick badly. The puppet and Kev picked it up and gave it a go, and that was that. It's true. Like it absolutely. Oh, that wasn't true about you badly lip syncing. You never. You're not going to be. You know, an expert at the door. Come on, but. Um, but I hadn't picked up and used a puppet in years, and I picked up the puppet, and it was just... It all came back. Everything came back. And there was no... Uh, there was no putting that genie back in the bottle. And so welcome to the genie. Just getting some more pins out here, because we will need them. For these arms. Hopefully that's enough, we'll see. <laughs> you can see the synapses reconnecting. It was, I felt bad actually, because like, you know, that day and then like the next day at breakfast, that's all I could talk about. And uh, I certainly hope I didn't bore anybody. But, you know, when it's, when it happens, it happens. You can't fight it. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad, Pickle. It's uh, the whole kind of point of this stream is this is what this is what I would be doing every day anyway. Like I said, my only source of income right now is building puppets for the Etsy store. So I figured let's just get some cameras and do it live. I'm sure there'd be people who would like to see how these things are made. So the techniques that I use um, are the tech, are the kind of techniques that professional puppet builders do use um, and materials. So you are seeing how for real Muppets are made. And it's not quite as glamorous as you might think. It's a lot of trial and error. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Scumboy. It um, clearly wasn't a phase. <laughs> This is having some staying power in like the last 8,000 creative projects I've tried. So let me see, after I get this pinned, I think we'll make the other plastic bits. Uh, puppets are real, so they definitely don't get made. Yeah. Puppets are born, not made. Other thing we're going to be doing at some point in the near future, still haven't quite figured out when, is those Frankie Play streams where Frankie, at least his animated avatar, He's going to play video games, hopefully, with Scumboy and uh, other folks. How long did it take to nail down the Greebly design? Greeblies took a while. Um, actually, that's a good question. Let's talk about that. Um, so, kind of one of the objectives I have for my store uh, is that I want to build stuff that a, I would want to buy, but also that aren't terribly expensive. Professional puppets can get very expensive, and they should, because it takes a lot of labor hours to make these things, as you see, as you see what goes into it. And this is just a simple puppet. This isn't complicated. This is going real fast. But when I designed the Greebly, my, I had a few kind of goals in mind. I wanted something that was, of course, a bit fraggly. Um, but I wanted the head to be reminiscent of Kermit because everybody wants a Kermit, of course. Um, but still, not exactly a Fraggle or not Kermit. The legally distinct, obviously, but also that kind of had the little hint of that stuff. But that I could also make quickly that didn't use a ton of materials. <laughs> you know, there's a whole lot of like 
it's got to be this, it's also got to be this, it's also got to be this. And some of these things are contradictory. Um, so it took about six or seven prototypes to get to this point where it is uh, like one pretty simple design that I can make quickly. It took a while. I had like 12 heads at some point, of <laughs> all different sizes and shapes and just kind of dialing into exactly how I wanted it. Um, but I did get there eventually, but that's the thing. It's like the development time. Um, I consider that just, that's part of an investment, right? Like I don't, that doesn't factor into the cost of the actual finished product because that's just time I've taken to, to develop these things. It was similar with the small. The small took four or five prototypes to get to the point of, uh, of a production worthy design. Um, but the Greeblies by far were the longest. Um, but also because they were the first, right? That's the first thing I ever designed and built for real, 100% from scratch. So it took a while and it took a lot, but thankfully uh, it ended up in a good place. But that's kind of the philosophy of the store is I want to make things that people can afford to buy. Um, because if you've ever priced a professional puppet from a big studio, let me tell you, not cheap. An order of magnitude of complexity between the small and the greebly. Kind of, not as much as you might think, but yes. Uh, it's just because the small has a full foam body under structure. The deluxe greeblies also have a full foam body under structure, but that's a deluxe greebly. That's why the deluxe. Where does the greebly name come from? That is an excellent question. And I'll bet somebody out there might know. Scumboy, do you know? I'll bet you know. You should know. Let's wait to see if you have an answer. <laughs> Go ahead. Actually, I guess since I'm the streamer, I should probably, uh, I should probably say, when they were building the models for the original Star Wars, it's small. I thought it was small. Yeah, well, this is, you know, the small is small, right? I'm using internet language because that's what the kids do. Um, when they were building the model kits for the original Star Wars, i.e. A New Hope, although it wasn't yet called A New Hope, um, particularly the surface of the Death Star, they would cannibalize, um, like, they would go to hobby stores and just buy all of their, like, battleship model kits and stuff, and they would just pull them apart and use them for pieces. And um, they would have little, like, panels that had just fiddly little detail work on them. Nothing that you could clearly identify, but just like little shapes and squares and rectangles and pipes and stuff. <clears throat> Kit bashing, exactly. Um, and they ended up calling those fiddly little detail panels Greeblies. Also called them Nernies. Nernies and Greeblies are the same thing. Um, and that just kind of became part of the language of the model shop was, oh, pass me a Greebly. Right. And so when I was coming up with a name for my just kind of generic overall Muppety kind of puppet, it just Greebly seemed good. So uh, the Universal Greebly is from a tank model. I did not know that. You learned something new. But there we go. So that's where the name Greebly comes from. Wow, that is a bent pin. Look at that pin. I should throw that pin out. Nope. He's gonna use it. Watch, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be making, I'm gonna be sewing these arms, I'm gonna be get myself stabbed by a pin and it's gonna be that pin. Uh, not a very cute name for lovely puppets. Well, one of the things I try and kind of do is I like a, a certain degree of creepiness, a kind of like monstery, you know, Tim Burton -y kind of creepiness. And I, I try and get that into my original designs. The small was originally intended to be a little more creepy than it ended up being. It ended up being much cuter <laughs> than what was in my head. But I like a little bit of creepiness. So uh, what I'm gonna do now that these arms are all pinned, I'm just gonna cut a big square out and free these from the bulk of the fabric. There we go. 
And I think maybe I'll cut them, separate them, and do them one at a time as well. Hello, Zap. How are you this fine day? I am well. Actually, I'm not that good, but... <laughs> but we're still making the puppets. Yes, it is. It is most definitely Monday. It is uh, uh, an exceptionally Monday Monday. It is gloomy and gray and I think maybe raining. But we're building puppets. So how bad can it be? So I am going to cut these and separate them. I'm a little bit nervous about the distance here, because when you run this through on the machine, you need a decent seam allowance. So let me just... Let me just mark that, and I'll also do it here. I want to make sure I leave enough room. Monday is extremely Monday. All right. Sunny day. Don't sing the whole song, you'll get a copyright complaint. <laughs> okay, so now we've got our head, our arms, and our body, and these are ready to get sewn. So what we have left, let me just organize my patterns here. Next thing is to build the other plastic bits. So the hand plates and the back plate for the eyes. So, you can get those out. Uh, here's the back plate for the eyes. Teeny tiny little thing. There's the hand plate. Yeah, the green and blue are nice together. That's a, that's a light kind of, uh, I think it's called peacock in the uh, the Puppet Pelts catalog. It's, it's a very soft kind of corn silk fur. All of the fur that I get is called Mongolian. I think it's because it's supposed to be uh, it's, a, it's all synthetic, but it's um, supposed to be like mimicking the properties of Mongolian yak fur, which is a very common kind of fur that's used in costuming and stuff. Because they got a lot of yaks in Mongolia, and uh, I believe they're largely vegetarian, so they don't do much with them. They milk, they milk the yaks and, uh, and shave them, I guess. <laughs> Ah, uh, the shaven yak. So I got some old plastic bits here that I'm just going to make these plates out of. I prefer the Brooklyn yak fur. So we're just tracing out these hand plates are what go inside the hands and hold the wire armature for the fingers. Which we will make soon. Uh, let me do another one here. You can see the, the former mouth plates <laughs> that have been cut out here. Don't waste anything. That's why I never throw out a bent pin. I do throw out a bent pin. You saw me throw out a bent pin if you watched the last stream. Or the stream before that, I don't remember. This is the fourth stream! That's that's wild. Uh, and also, I'm gonna need a thinner pen for this one. <sighs> yeah, well, that's um, one of the things I'm, I advocate for often in puppet building groups is upcycling. 
uh, plastic wherever you can find it. I mean, there's tons of plastic that we just toss into, you know, the green bin and landfills and stuff. And uh, and you can use that inside a puppet. So, there's that. This isn't going to be fun to cut out, but hey, I like a challenge. It's marking center. Center lines drawn in. That's important. Here we go. Um, yeah, actually, some of the some of the early mouth plates that I would use that are made in uh, like for song puppets and stuff. Um, a lot of those because the mouth plates are small, they're like um, margarine container tops. Just wash them really good, sand them down, and they're great. It's just it's just plastic. They're a little bit flexible, so you can you know you can do stuff performance wise with them. It's good. This plastic is just the top off of a uh, dollar store storage bin. Very commonly used material. One hand plate. That is an Adam Krutinger trick. That's uh, what Adam Krutinger suggests for smaller mouth plates. For anything bigger than than a Greebly, I, uh, I actually have sheets of uh, one eighth inch birch plywood. Like when I use a when I make a big furry monster, that's usually what the mouth plates are made out of. Because the bigger it gets, you need a little bit more structure. This this thin plastic would start to bend under the weight of, uh, or under the stresses of gluing in a big foam head. Oops. Come on. There we go. Okay. So... These bits go back in the scrap bag. Now I got... Two more things I need to do with these plastic bits. I got to file down the edges. Not so much on the hand plates. Those go. These get sandwiched in between bits of foam. But uh, the eye plate, I definitely need to, to file down the edges. And then I got to drill all these holes. And that we will be getting the drill press out for again. Uh, so let me. Forgive me, this is going to be off camera again, but it's kind of wild how Frankie just kind of slips out when I'm not paying attention. This is great. You get to watch the top of my head. Excellent. This is primo streaming, Kevin. That's perfect. I wonder if this is any better. Is this better? I'm out of focus. <laughs> Noel and Frankie have very similar. I think uh, I think one is uh, one derived from the other, or they're the same archetype. Noel is a character in a cartoon that Scumboy and I were working on years ago that you can still find on the internet somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where. Um, but Noel was uh, one of the many inspirations that went into making up Frankie. Yes, the share of vocal DNA. That's a very good way of putting it. They're both sensible. They're both a uh, little sarcastic. They're both very practical. They both call out stuff that seems stupid.
That's what they should have got for the presidential debates, I tell you. Look, shut up, you orange idiot. I'm, you, you're, you're done talking and not making any sense at all. When you can complete a full sentence, then you can talk. See? I could have fixed the whole thing right there. Frankie, don't moderate the debates. <laughs> Filing music, please. Six viewers. Honestly, that's wild. I think when I was board game streaming, the most I ever had at one time was four. I know I'm out of focus, by the way. It's because I'm using a fixed focus camera. If I'm over here, oh, hey, look, I'm in focus. But I gotta lean forward, so deal with it. I've noticed that Frankie comes to my rescue often. Frankie's just like, any good performer will tell you. Here we go on a tangent. Um, that, you know, to, to be true to a character, you kind of have to like reserve a little space in your brain where that character lives. And that's not you, that's that character. And so you can you can have a dialogue, <laughs> you know, with that character. It's a little bit schizophrenic, but you know. But when I can't think of something to say, you can sure bet that Frankie will think of something to say. Okay, we're almost done with the filing. Okay. I think that's pretty good. We'll go back to here. Whew. Plastic dust, my favorite. Ah, ignore that. Okay, so now we gotta drill some holes. And to do that, oh, of course I buried it. <laughs> Honestly, I'm thrilled. Even if there's just like one or two people, I'm totally cool with that. I, uh, it's just nice to hang out, you know? Quality, not quantity, that's what's important. Uh, so we got, we'll do the, hey there, big wide angle. This is the best angle I can get for like showing the whole table. So, uh, get our eye protected, of course, always. And we start drilling some holes. Chill vibes and the occasional email to distract from it, yeah. Uh, so Jamie, I don't know if you've been around for me talking about this. I'm using the NVIDIA broadcast um, plug, oh, camera's up there, plug-in um, for both the, 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 the shop webcam and the mic. Um, the mic filter is incredible. I'm, this is a Dremel, okay? I'm turning a Dremel on. Nothing. This is a hair dryer. <laughs> I'm not sure actually if the. Eh, all right. Okay, so they are both coming through. I guess maybe the uh, the plugin isn't working quite as well as I would like to, or maybe it's the new mic. You know what? I bet it's the new mic is more sensitive. But the old mic, those were silent. Um, so I guess I gotta tweak it a little bit. Nevertheless, yeah, I think the new mics are more sensitive. <laughs> it's not working. Good, you can hear the tools today. That's actually probably good. 
because um, it was a little weird watching the playback and having like the uh, the hairdryer be completely silent. Um, but uh, anyway, back to drilling. That's one. Yes, uh, this Dremel drill press is really cool. It's actually called the Dremel workstation because it can do more than just this uh, drill press thing. Like I, I could take this and move it at different angles and stuff. So I can it can just hold the Dremel in place. I can also like mount the uh, I got the flex arm. You can just sort of mount the flex arm off of this, and it's it's really really useful. Um, also should be like uh, bolted down to the surface. I don't because I need to move it around, and I'm only drilling light little things like this. So. If I was drilling anything heavier than this, I would I would want to at least clamp it down because you can you can like it can just lift off, right? So, gotta be a little careful. But the holes are drilled, so this just goes back here and lives next to the sewing machine. Let's see how's this? There we go. Uh, yeah, I'm really really happy with that drill press because. Um, I found through experience that like I could, you know, like use a leather punch or something to make these holes, but I found that this particular plastic, uh, if you, oh, I still got my eye protection on, um, if you, like any sudden impact can shatter this plastic. So this is why the drill press is nice, because I could just go nice and slow and uh, all it does is make a little flash that you can just pull off rather than shatter the plastic because that would be bad. Okay, let me think what comes next. Uh, maybe we'll get the machine out because we've got some hand sewing coming up. Well, you know what? I haven't cut out the fabric mouth plate yet. Let's do that. Fabric mouth plate. Now I gotta decide what fabric I wanna use for the mouth lining. I have a few options. Let me just find the pattern first. Because of course I put that away. Or did I? Hmm. Hmm. It's in here somewhere, I swear. Oh, maybe I didn't put it away yet. Excuse me while I look for a pattern. I should have. Do you still use the Cricut for puppets? So I do, but it's not as much as you might think. It's limited use. Um, I often will cut features like tongues and uvulas and pupils out with it. Um, but for doing big bulk stuff like the, you definitely can't put fur on it. And for the fleece, you have to massage it so much. Like the, 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 the mats that it goes on are sticky, right? So you have to put the fleece um, fiber side down and then when you pull it off, it pulls off a whole bunch of the fibers, which is okay, but then it means like it's kind of the mat is one use and then you got to clean it again. And that's not terribly efficient. So it actually takes about the same amount of time to just hand cut it and then sew it as it does to cut it on the cricket. So 
<laughs> you know, it's not really a time saver. It is far more precise than I can get cutting by hand. But sometimes you don't need the precision. Sometimes it's more important to, to go faster, all right, so. But it is absolutely indispensable for doing things like tongues and uvulas. I've, <laughs> I've lost the pattern for the fabric mouth plate. Brilliant. All right. I have to pull it all out. Hang on. No, that's not it. Ugh. This always happens. It just doesn't usually happen on camera. I've probably chucked it to the side somewhere. Okay. Head. Arm. Uh, body front. Body back. Uh, foam hand plate. We're going to need that soon. Foam for a deluxe Screebly. Bottom sleeve for a fleece Screebly. Skull. Body. All fleece Screebly pattern. No mouth plates. I've put the mouth plates somewhere else. I must have. Uh, would it be good for mouth plate fabric? Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, I cut a bunch of ultra suede on it for when I was building Kermit. And they came out real nice. Um, but like, for example, in this case, let's say, let's say I hadn't lost the pattern and I had them here and I was about to cut a fabric mouth plate. Um, in order to do it on the Cricut, I would have to like load up the software, get the pattern, put the, put the fabric on the thing, feed it into the Cricut. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there are steps to go through to get to the point where you're actually cutting something. Whereas I can just put a piece of cardboard on the fabric, trace it and cut it out. And it's actually faster, right? And in th this is a case where precision isn't 100% required. So it's actually better to just do it by hand in this case. If you can find the... I've literally lost the pattern. I do not believe it. It was right here. <gasps> Found it. <laughs> it's under my phone. Ah, everything's fine. Yeah, so like stuff like... Yeah, here's, this is a bucket of tongues and uvulas. And these were all cut on the cricket. And like, you can just see the precision is, is beautiful on these. Um, right? But, um, so this is what it's great for. I'll just cut a whole sheet of tongues and uvulas and pupils if I want a weird shape or a weird uh, size for a pupil. Um, I'll just cut a whole, like I gotta kind of plan ahead. So it's like today I'm gonna cut a whole sheet of tongues and then just, <laughs> fill up the tongue bucket. <laughs> um, and that's what it's really good for. So I'm still glad I have it. I just don't use it as much as you might think. Um, okay, so this is this is the rigid mouth plate. This is the fabric mouth plate. So this is what we're going to use to cut our fabric mouth. So let's see. I like doing red. When I do green uh, skin, I like doing... Uh, you hear the, uh, yeah, the tongue bucket. How full is your tongue bucket? It's my new self-help book. How full is your tongue bucket? Um, I like doing red mouths for when I do green skins. Uh, although black could be nice too. Hmm. I did, the last thing I did, we did the small, I did a red mouth with green fleece. So let's do black. I'm going to do black and I'm going to put a red tongue in it. Let me just get my fabric here. So this, no, oh, that's velvet. This, I know I'm off camera. It'll happen. This is uh, a bit messy, covered in all kinds of fur, because this is in the fur corner. I have a whole corner full of fur over here. Um, this is black ultra suede. And the nice thing about it, you can kind of see this on camera. It tried to follow me. Yeah, I know, I'm just, I was out of frame. Um, this is a really nice kind of texture on it. You can see it on camera a bit. It's, it's just, it's got that leathery kind of quality to it. And it's really nice, I think, to use in uh, the inner 
lining for the mouth. The other option, of course, is to use velvet. And the nice thing about velvet is it just absorbs on camera. It just absorbs the light until it's just black. Um, I have a fur corner too, but that's just the cat bed. Yeah, tell me about it. Um, we haven't seen Jimmy in a while. Oh, I've got the door closed. That's why. Because I was gluing earlier, so I got the door closed. I'm going to keep it closed because it's nice and quiet. Um, so I could also use velvet. Um, but I have become quite fond of this Ultra Suede instead of velvet, just because of this nice texture. It just, it looks, it reads nice on camera. So I'm going to use this. This does not stretch, so we don't have to worry about what direction it goes in. Uh, we just need a little corner. Look at all, look at all the fur all over it. Look at this. Terrible. Gonna have to take a uh, lip brush before I sell this. Okay, so for drawing on dark fabrics, we need our gold or silver Sharpie. Yeah, I just saw on your mic test, yeah. Oh, that wasn't my mic test because I wasn't allowed to put on my mic yet. I had a cat in my lap. There we go. There's going to be a bunch of hand sewing coming up, so whoever's in this for the long haul is going to be a big boring bit coming up relatively soon. But... I think before we get there, I'm going to take a short break and refill my coffee. That's important. So there we go with the fabric. Oh, that's that shows up real well on the camera. And so we'll just join up our center lines here, accounting for the thickness of the pen. Voila. Once now, we cut. Let's use these. No, let's use these. Uh, do, 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 do. It's going to rough cut first. So I can put the giant roll of Ultra Suede back. I'm going to have to order some more of this Ultra Suede soon. I usually order most of my fabrics from the good folks at Puppet Pelts. Laurie and Cindy, how you doing? Um, but sometimes they don't have, like the only color, they only carry one color of Ultra Suede. I think they carry like two. They're both red. Um, and so I went to a larger fabric outlet, kind of a more uh, bulk industrial <laughs> kind of outlet. Uh, and I got this stuff. They have all kinds of colors of Ultra Suede. And I even got some purple. So that's going to be for the new Frankie. Because Frankie has purple ears and a purple tummy. Okay, so we're just going to cut this out. I just had to look for a second to make sure this was the fabric mostly, because it looks a little large to my eye, but it's actually been a while since I made a Greebly. I've been making a lot of smalls, and so everything <laughs> everything looks huge now compared to making a small. Uh, yeah, I know that's off camera. It'll happen. More important to do it right. This is the stuff, uh, I remember Pi asked the other day about fraying. This is the Ultra Suede that does fray quite easily. So I'm making very clean, precise cuts to try and help it not do that. Thank you. 
It's not going so well on the bottom here, but it'll be fine once I sew it. All right, there we go, fabric mouth plate. Uh, I am covered in smuts from the fur. You should see when I build a big furry monster, it is, there's just fur everywhere. I gotta vacuum like five times before I can get it all up, uh, including off of me. Okay, we're gonna take this mouth plate pattern and put it back where it belongs so I don't lose it again. Like a responsible adult. Uh, so the other thing that we need to do, I'm trying to decide what the order of operations here should be. We've got everything cut out that we need to run through the machine, so why don't we do that first? And we will take all of our bits that we're not using currently. Excuse my back. And we will put them we will put them, we will put them up on the shelf. And I'm going to count on you to remind me of this. Next to, can the camera get this? Yes, it can. See this green guy here? That's Raybo, which you may have seen on the Oracle channel. He is the prototype, the final prototype Greebly. This is my little museum of prototypes. Um, and Raybo is the prototype Greebly. So he's guarding our our bits currently. <laughs> that's where I put those. So when when I go to like grope around and try and find them, that's where they are. You know what I should do? Excuse me one second. I gotta check my mic battery. Nah, we're still good. How long have we been streaming for? Two and a half hours, and we're we're barely getting started. That's not true. Actually, we're well on the way. Uh, so let's do the green stuff first. Gotta get the machine. Here's the machine. We're gonna switch to the, the wide angle so you can at least see something. And to save my aching back, literally. You're gonna raise up the platform here. And we have some green thread in the bobbin already. Nice. Where'd the other green thread go? <laughs> oh, Kevin. Seriously, get a grip. Here. You were going to get a coffee. I'm going to get a coffee before I start the hand sewing. This is the machine sewing. So I haven't earned my coffee yet. It's all about self-discipline, kids. What sewing machine am I using? That's a good question. It is a Singer. It is an older Singer. I don't know the actual model. It was my wife's before we met. <laughs> and it was kind of sitting in the closet, not doing much. And I talked about this before, but like I've been thinking about getting a new one. Cause I mean, this is fine. Like it, it, it doesn't, it's not great, it's not the most sophisticated sewing machine, but it does everything I need it to do. So I don't really have a motivation to spend the money to get a new one, because this works just fine. This doesn't have an auto threader, which is a pain, but as long as you're patient, you can get it done. So like always, I'm gonna run a piece of scrap through just to make sure it's threaded properly.
so the, the short answer is I have no idea. I'm sure there's a serial number I mean, somewhere here. Uh, not really. <laughs> 621B, maybe, or 9805C, maybe. I don't know, either of them. I like how the music got ominous. <laughs> yeah, you know, the music knows. It's psychotropic. It knows what's coming. My relationship with sewing machines is... Uh, fragile at best. All right, that seems okay. It went well the first time, I don't trust it. Uh, let's start with the head. <laughs> In any other context, that's very ominous. Something weird's going on here. Hang on. Get the thread. Okay. Cool. Just want to make sure it's not going to go anywhere. I don't want it to go. Uh, thread. Ominous music maestro, please. behave you. Not behaving. This is the opposite of behaving machine. good enough seam allowance here, so it's getting a little squirrely. That looks rough. It's pretty rough. Might be okay, though. I mean, we do have some forgiveness in the materials itself, so let me just have a look. Sometimes things don't quite work. Uh, yeah, actually, it looks okay. I think we'll be all right. I'm going to pop a couple of hand stitches in there just to, just to buy us some insurance, I think. Actually, no. I'm going to roll it on the machine one more time, just to... Just to make sure we're okay. I try and do extra diligence on stuff like this when I'm putting it up on the shop, so... got very, uh, I don't know, it's like, like the casino in Battlestar Galactica, the original movie. I guess that was all disco. That one. All right, well, this is pretty sloppy, but it'll be fine once it's all sewn up. Hmm. 
Sheen is not being friendly today. But, I mean, that's the beautiful thing. Once you turn it, it looks lovely. So, I think we'll be fine. Let's see how it goes now. My problem here is I didn't leave a good enough seam allowance. That is not the case with the hands, thankfully. So I think we'll be a little bit easier on the hands. This is going better. Get those pins out. Drop the foot. That went better. I always like to put a couple of hand stitches at the beginning and end just for insurance, because although we back stitch it on the machine to lock it all into place, I don't trust it. And the last thing I want is for one of my puppets to start coming apart. We aims for quality. All right, so there's the head stitched up. And now we're gonna do the arms. One problem is this isn't quite high enough. There we go. So this is the edge of the arm where there's the gap. So Backstitch that a few times because that needs to be really strong because as you will see, it's about to undergo some extreme stresses. All right, not bad. Now comes the fiddly bit, going around the fingers. the pin out, then drop the foot. down and this is where it gets very fiddly this 
do. You sink the needle, lift the foot, reposition the fabric, drop the foot, move the needle. That's the process. There's no shortcut around this. When you're going around the fingers, there's such tight corners that you really kind of have to do it by hand. hand -ish. You have to hand crank the machine so it goes very, very slow. But once I get to this corner, I'll actually slow down and show you. So when you come to a very tight corner, mm, boy, that's really blown out, isn't it? You can't really see it. Um, turn the light off without turning. No, I can't. <laughs> it, oh, well, um, what, you, what you have to do when you're going around a tight corner, you have to stop hand crank it so the needle is all the way down, then lift the foot, reposition the fabric so that when it's going through the machine, it's going in the right direction, then drop the foot, then hand crank it. A few stitches till the corner starts to turn again, sink the needle, lift the foot, reposition the fabric, drop the foot. You see what I mean by fiddly? Of course, the alternative is to just ansew this whole thing, which would be considerably slower than this and not really yield that much better of a result. So this is still faster than that. I can't believe how late it is. It's 1244 already. Wow. All right. I gotta be honest, I'm not sure we're doing the whole puppet in one stream. We'll see. Then pin under there. Oops. All right, we're almost there. That's one hand. Why aren't you coming out? You should just be, okay, fine. Be like that. Uh, okay, that's all right. And then we're gonna do the other hand. I think I just, yes, I just kind of unthreaded my machine here, so. Uno momento, por favor. Chill beats today, so existential dread beats today. I love it. Yes, I guess you were here, Zep. Um, the chill beats that we were using, the Twitch soundtrack thing, uh, is licensed for Twitch but is not licensed for YouTube, it turns out. And of course I put the archives up on YouTube <sighs> and I got hit with copyright complaints, not DCMAs. I don't actually have to do anything about it. The videos are still fine. It's not a strike against me, but uh, it's still um, a copyright complaint that I just don't want to deal with. So I had to look for a different music service that in theory is licensed for both YouTube and Twitch. So this is Pretzel Rocks. And I'm not sure I like it. <laughs> their, uh, their actual chill station was not chill at all. It was actually verging into Nine Inch Nails territory, which is not a knock against Nine Inch Nails, but they're definitely not chill. However, this is, it is what it is. <laughs> I 
<laughs> we can get shredding guitars. There's a metal station on, <laughs> on the uh, Pretzel Rocks. Let's get Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem to come in and just do their thing. That'd be all right. This is a narrative of very heavy duty proportions. I don't have a station that is out of copyright jazz or the like. Not that I found. I could probably put in the work because like I was saying before, plenty of the stuff I listen to is public domain. Um, but it's just a matter of does the algorithm know that, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> it, it maybe not. Like, who knows? Like, I know all of the Alan Lomax recordings of early jazz and blues artists may or may not be in the public domain. It's all, it's about the individual recordings, right? So I don't know. And it's just a thing I don't want to deal with, right? Believe me, I would love it if I could just put on some jazz or blues or funk. We need some, we need some P-funk. Yep, you are exactly right, Scumboy. This is the problem with not having strong public domain laws. Everything is for profit. Yay, capitalism. <laughs> Just hire a guy to sit behind you and play live jazz. Hmm. I'll just call up Tuba Skinny. Hey, you guys ain't doing nothing, right? Get yourself on Zoom. We can work this out. Dandy Wellington. Yeah, for sure. We get Tuba Skinny and Diddy Willinkin to do a collab. What do you think? I think that's an excellent idea. Although that would mean that Erica Lewis, well, you know what her, like Erica Lewis and, and Dandy could do a duet. That'd be all right. Erica Lewis is the vocalist for Tuba Skinny and she has one of the most amazing voices in the biz, as it were. Now, you know who we do need to get together is Doreen Ketchens and uh, Dandy Wellington. Doreen Ketchens is a clarinetist who works on uh, Royal Street often, and she is astonishingly good. One of the best. We had a little jazz in our cocktails. So the dulcet tones of Dandy Wellington on the puppet trip. We did indeed. That was my birthday dinner at... Um, I've actually forgotten the name of the club. <laughs> Sorry, club. <laughs> Great brunch, though. Yeah, Hotel Chantrell or something, I want to say. I could look it up, but I'm sewing a puppet arm right now. So.
Did I get it right? <laughs> I actually got it right. Hotel Chantrell. Hey, what do you know? 52 years old and he can remember some things. Here we go. All right. Both arms are stitched. So now we've got to do the body. The body is real easy because it's just two straight lines. But as you can see, the body is blue. And the thread we got in here is green. Uh, how they recommend the rooftop dining area. Yes. If the, if, the, if the world ever opens again, uh, we can endorse the Hotel Chantrell. Uh, the first time that we went there, we had brunch, my wife and I, and it was excellent. And then when Scumboy and I and our partners did my birthday dinner there, we had dinner and it was even better. Those cocktails were amazing, but, but then COVID. Uh, so anyway, I am going to use the green thread with the blue fur. Um, because if this works well, <laughs> which, you know, who knows, um, you shouldn't be able to see this thread at all. Yeah, they were not messing around with those cocktails. That was a series. We had a mixologist in, in uh, residence. For sure. So, this is not a great seam. What are, why did I not do good seam allowances this time? What is wrong? Hmm. Better go slow with this one. Uh, you wanted to do a hard mode puppet. For the stream apparently <laughs> yeah yes this is not and this is even like this is one of the easiest puppets that i have to build what's that it's monday that's what it is this is fine this is going fine i just think maybe sitting down doing this whole thing in a single stream may be a bit ambitious Hey, the longer I stream, the more chance we have of getting new viewers, right? That's how that works. All right, there's one side. Is it the words on the on the machine here says easy thread. I don't think that's accurate. Maybe that's in comparison to like wooden sewing machines from the pioneer days, which there weren't. This wants to slide. I can feel it wanting to slide. Don't slide. Cease your infernal sliding. All right. 
let me have a look at this. It's not bad. I kind of went off the line a bit at the end there, but let me see if I can correct that. I've seen worse. I've done worse. But just in the interest of tidiness. See you, scumboy. Uh, we'll see if I'm still streaming when you come back. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. All right. Okay. I think I think I'd like to keep going. I just gotta kind of chill, just kind of get relaxed and. Uh, this is the thing about streaming, is you kind of feel uh, a responsibility to be, like, on and entertaining, you know? Uh, and that takes energy. And I ain't got a lot of energy today, I tell you, folks. But I think if I just want to chill out and do my thing, maybe we can get through this. Okay. So that's it for the machine sewing. That's all done. That ain't bad. Come uh, on, Bertha. I got a mess to clean up. I gotta. I really gotta clean the studio. And I'm gonna put this camera. Wow, that's a great shot. Look at that. Couldn't be better. Just cause the. Uh, the next bit is some hand sewing, and by some I mean a lot. So this is what we get to chill. All right, platform is down. I guess the first thing to sew in is fabric mouth plate. Oh, amazing cinematography. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Okay, so we've got our bits. Um, or maybe I could, hmm, before I get to the hand sewing, I'm just gonna cut these hands out uh, and uh, and turn them. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll do the arms all at once. So I'll build the, uh, I'll build the inserts for the arms all at once. So, here we go. So this is just, just like we did with the small, this is just a matter of trimming along the outside of that stitch. Uh, I have left the tops open here as well, you'll see why. This is how the arms get attached to the body. I use doll joints, which are very handy. And I probably could use, I have small doll joints that I could use for the smalls, smalls. Um, but I like how the kind of pinched sewing edge uh, of the arm, like at the shoulders on the small, makes the arms flop around nicely. And uh, I think that's, it's worth putting in that, that little bit of extra effort there, I think. Because the smalls don't have arm rods, so the only arm movements are, you know, the flopping around bits. And yes, I could do smalls with arm rods, but <laughs> one of the points of doing a puppet without arm rods uh, is practical. Uh, shipping costs a lot of money, uh, and it's a significant factor in the total cost of a puppet. And unfortunately, having, you know, an 18-inch arm rod means that there is a minimum size of box that that puppet can go in. Even if it's a small puppet that you could fold up or something, um, you still got to put the arm rods in there and you can't bend them or anything. So even if you make them removable, this still has to be at least an 18 inch long box, right? So uh, making a puppet that doesn't have arm rods saves on shipping. So the total cost of the puppet can come down. And these are the things you have to think about when you run an Etsy store. 
And like I keep saying, I try to keep my costs down so more people can afford them. And that is one of the factors. So that's when you got to get creative. Make a puppet that doesn't need arm rods. This puppet, however, the smalls do have arm rods. And we'll be getting to those shortly. Shortly is a relative term for a uh, three hour stream. <laughs> See, even more, just facts, of the all facts, uh, patterns. Here you go, it's a DIY puppet situation. All you got to do is tune into the stream to see how to make them. No problem. I'll send you a pattern in an old coat. You can make it just like Jim made the original Kermit. There is a question. Uh, I mean, you y'all probably know the story that the first Kermit was made out of uh, an old coat uh, of Jim's mother's that he cut up. There's a question about, of course, is that really true? He never, I don't believe he ever said one way or the other that is in fact the actual for real truth. Um, he did, however, say that the original eyes were in fact ping pong balls. Um, there's a video of him saying that. So. That part, at least, is true. But the whole green coat thing... Well, first of all, as we talked about before, the original Kermit... The original, original Kermit wasn't green. It's a turquoise blue color. A <laughs> crammed the completed puppet into the facts. It'll get there, yep. One of those fleece faxes, right? It prints fleece. It's like a 3D printer. It's like a replicator from Star Trek. It'll be fine. Um, so anyway, we've cut the arms out. Now I'm going to turn them. And the way that we turn them is we just flip it through that gap. Sorry. And I'm just going to push it through. Get a pen to help. Sounds like a coat color, turquoise. Yes, well, well, the thing that can lend credence to that myth being true is that um, the original Antron fleece uh, was often used in coat linings. So it's, it's entirely possible that the original Kermit was in fact made from a coat lining. We just have no documentary evidence to say that, so. It's important. To have citations. So here we go. I'm just poking the end of the Sharpie and getting the fingers turned the right way around. The, uh, the, the myth of the first Kermit building is probably on the same lines as the myth of the Henson stitch in that there is some truth, but it's got mixed up with legend over time. It's a nice story, but it probably isn't 100% uh, accurate. But uh, it's all part of the magic of the Muppets. The first skirt was not made, it was found. Um, uh, go check, I mean, I'm sure there's a bunch on YouTube. In fact, I know there's a bunch on YouTube. Go check out Sam and Friends on YouTube and you will see a bunch of the original, original Kermit. And he was very different from the nice guy that we all came to know. He was kind of odd and abrasive and angry. You can still see a little hint of that every time Kermit gets exasperated. 
the, the kind of the old angry Gerbit comes out. <laughs> Hanson just found a strange little frog sitting in a swamp that he adopted. That mean little frog. <laughs> Look, I'm just uh, trying to play my banjo when you're you're interrupting me. I, I don't think that's really a... It's not, it's not very nice. All right, so there's our hands turned right side in, and uh, that's all we're going to do with these for the moment. Now we get to the hand sewing. So uh, here we've got our inner mouth plate, and this is going to get sewn, just like we did with the small, to the inside of the head. Now, this is something I did off camera with the small, I remember now, um, because this takes a little while. But uh, one thing that I should do with this, now, of course, when you lay this in, you have to get it precise. And so what you should do is use a whole bunch of pins and pin this in place. I am, I think the technical term is clumsy. <laughs> so, uh, I find that very difficult to get that right. So I have developed my own method of, of laying these mouth plates in that works a bit better for me. And instead of pinning it at all, what I do is I do uh, tacking stitches. I'll take a stitch and I'll stitch just the top to the top. And then I'll stitch just the bottom corner to the bottom. And then I'll kind of eyeball, which is bad and you shouldn't do, but I have to, it's because it's me, um, where the center line is. And that's where the center mark can come in handy. You know, let's align the center with the center. Do a tacking stitch there, do a tacking stitch on the other side. And so it's kind of joined at the four corners and then I'll hand stitch the rest of it. So that's what I am going to do. Now, um, the color of the thread that you use for this, this is a question that some people have because uh, you know, what color do you use? Do you use the color of the fleece or do you use the color of the mouth plate? Um, remembering that this fleece, one of the properties of it is that it's thick and you can pick seams. So you should use the color of the mouth plate because the mouth plate is just very flat. There's no seam blending you can do here. So if you use the color thread of the mouth plate, in case you do see a stitch, that will blend in here. And if you do see a stitch on the on the green fleece, you can then blend that out, right? You can't blend the color of the mouth plate, you can blend the color of the fleece. So you use the color of the mouth plate, so if you see a stitch, it will blend into the mouth plate. That's the theory of that. So let's get some black thread. Uh, oh, you know what, I have to open a new... Oh no, I don't, here we go, this is good. Thread quality is also a big deal. Don't, don't cheap out. Get the good stuff. And yes, it does make a difference. Good quality thread will not tangle easily. And uh, that's one of the biggest time wasters is when thread tangles. Ouch. I'm fine. So let's see. Use our needle. This is going to take a while. I almost wonder. Should we cut the stream here? We'll pick this up on Wednesday. We start Wednesday with this. Maybe I'll sew this in. I'll sew this in off camera and then we'll start Wednesday. And the only bit of hand sewing then on Wednesday is going to be the head to the body. And that, that doesn't take too long. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll cut it here. It's going to be gone when the scum boy comes back. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is good. This is another few hours at least. So I think maybe doing it in one stream was a bit too ambitious because we've been going for three hours and 11 minutes. That's pretty, that's, that's long enough. I think I could use, a refresher. So um, maybe we'll cut it here and we'll come back on Wednesday and we'll finish it off. And that's not bad. Two streams for one puppet. That's pretty good. Uh, so yeah, I think we'll do that because I'm I'm kind of burning out a little bit. So let's do that. Did not, not have to push ourselves. The whole point of the thing is to be chill, right? I'm going to build something else uh, tomorrow. I'm not sure what yet, but I, I do have to keep building every day. But uh so maybe I'll have something interesting to show as well as this on Wednesday. So we don't know. Anyway, 
I'm going to head out. So thank you so much for being here, everybody. This is this is great. Every time we do this, it's, uh, it's so much fun. I really appreciate you being here. And um, we'll catch you on Wednesday.